In this lecture, we're going to uh, start looking at the mechanism for the free radical halogenation reaction. The thing about mechanisms are, at the start, they don't seem super useful, especially the first few that you learn. Um, but the more you get into them, the more you see their chemical relevance, and the more you're able to kind of use them to deepen your understanding of some of the chemical processes or some of the chemical phenomena that we know about, like electronegativity in particular. Um, and then the better you get at them, the more you're able to master chemical reactions. And what I mean by mastering chemical reactions is you're, you're able to understand chemical reactions that you may not have that much experience with rather quickly. And you can start to really predict the outcome of, I mean, easily thousands of reactions, the better you get at the mechanism of reactions. Um, you can predict the outcome of thousands of reactions without having to commit those thousands of reactions to memory. So what you'll notice is that like, as you get deeper and deeper into this stuff, maybe you will have learned 20 mechanisms for organic reactions by the end of organic two, maybe 30 or something. But that will be so powerful in describing so many reactions, not just the arcane reactions that um, like maybe a graduate student would study, but some of the most useful reactions in all of organic chemistry, the things that sustain life, the things that make the materials that we study. So I can't emphasize enough, and I, and I will continue to emphasize, learning mechanisms um, should be a high priority on your list as you're kind of traversing through your organic chemistry um, education. So anytime you get the opportunity to learn a mechanism, put that, put that as a high priority thing to get into your knowledge base uh, sooner rather than later. So. Let's get into this. Lecture 78, we're going to look at the mechanism for the free radical halogenation of alkanes. Okay, so I gave a pretty heavy preface into what a mechanism is. But um, let's just go ahead and write some stuff down. So mechanisms um, are, I'll just kind of say it this way, knowing mechanisms allows us to, sorry, I have a child in here. Knowing mechanisms allows us um, to avoid having to memorize thousands of reactions. And I'm not, I don't think I'm really um, overstating this. <laughs> this is a great way to understand organic chemistry. And it's going to be a hallmark of the entirety of organic chemistry too. And if you're interested, advanced organic chemistry. So, um, you know, start to develop these skills now. This is something you want to get good at. And it's not something that it's intuitive to anybody. So if you start off and you're like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Everybody is, nobody's just good at mechanisms. So what it is, is it's the story of the reaction, how the reaction proceeds. Okay, so, um, what we have is, let's say we take, I like to start with simple reactions because you're going to redraw structures over and over again. So it doesn't make sense to have like the most cumbersome to draw molecules as you're working through a mechanism. So let's say we take methane and let it react with Br2 under free radical halogenation conditions. That is you um, have heat or light present. You will form in this case, CH3 Br plus HBr. Now what we want to do is account for how the starting materials get converted into all of the products um, as best that we can. And we can get some insight into this if we're able to observe the reactive intermediates along the way or gain some evidence about the reactive intermediates along the way. What we know about this is radicals are involved. And that is to say free radicals, these things with an odd number of valence electrons or just a single unpaired valence electron um, as, as intermediates. So we have radical intermediates. I should just erase that as. 
radical intermediates um and hbr is a byproduct and what i mean by byproduct is we're typically interested in making the carbon containing products like ch3br we could make hbr by some different way so this isn't a very practical way of making hbr the other thing we know is that this is a chain reaction so we're going to see um, initiation propagation and termination events with the emphasis that this reaction is going to produce product in the propagation steps. Okay, so let's begin. Propose a mechanism. And all you can really do is propose a mechanism. We can get very confident in what mechanisms are and we can have some really compelling supporting evidence for the mechanisms that we propose but um, this is just one of those things where you propose it, you can't like know it or prove it um, with, a, with as much certainty as we can know and prove other things. We can get, we've gotten a lot better. We can actually kind of take pictures of these things, but if somebody wanted to come out with some new details, we would have to recognize um, that. And if somebody comes across an experiment, we can refute the mechanism entirely. So we can't really know for sure um, just because it's just, yeah, I, I won't get into it from there. We're going to continue to use this term propose uh, for the mechanism, especially when we're doing it on paper. So any chain reaction needs to start with an initiation step. And the initiation step allows us to form our intermediates. So we're going to take our starting materials and go into the intermediates. In this case, because it's a free radical process, we'll go from a situation where we have no intermediates to a situation where we have a few intermediates. Now the way this works is we're going to take our Br2 and let it convert into Br dot plus Br dot. So we have two bromine radicals that are formed. Two, fro uh, two times free radicals that are formed. Now, the way this works is that we actually undergo a homolysis reaction. Now, we've seen this before. This is a typical way that we break bonds to make radicals, right? We do homolysis reactions. This actually occurs whenever you take a dihalide and expose it to enough heat or enough light. You'll crack the bond in half. So a diatomic halogen, Br2, Cl2, F2, I2, they all do this. When you shine light on them, we have a very unstable bond. And as a result, we're going to see, um, we're going to see you, uh, we're going to see these things split in half um, when we shine light or expose them to heat. And we can actually draw curly arrows for this process. And that's an important thing. In every one of these steps of our mechanism, whether it's initiation, propagation, or termination, we need to have curly arrows that describe the formation of products. Okay, so we show two curly arrows that are fish hook arrows showing the movement of one electron. They're gonna take the two electrons in the covalent bond between the Br atoms and allow them to move in opposite directions to homolyze the bond, break it in half, everybody gets the same number of electrons to form our two bromine radicals. So we must include the curly arrows. Okay, and that's important for every step, as I just mentioned. Every step needs to have curly arrows to account for why things are happening the way that they're happening. That is to say that all steps in a mechanism need curly arrows. So every step needs curly arrows and a mechanism. Now, after this, we form the two radicals. With the two radicals in hand, the initiation is complete. Now we're ready to enter propagation.
okay? So with propagation, we're going to go from zero radicals to, um, excuse me, we're going, we're going to have radicals on both the left side and the right side of the reaction, okay? So now in this case, we're going to start by generating a carbon radical. So bromine free radicals sit around and they're sort of, the bromine radical is desperate to form a covalent bond. And what it will do in this case is it will get so desperate that it will um, find a way to form its octet by reacting with a hydrogen atom to form HBr. And in particular, it's one of the hydrogen atoms on our alkane. What this looks like is the hydrogen rips off the, um, excuse me, the bromine rips off the hydrogen to form HBr, hydrobromic acid, along with a carbon-centered radical. So it sort of rips off or abstracts the hydrogen. So this is called the hydrogen abstraction step. Now, the way this works is that the bond between carbon and hydrogen undergoes homolysis. So I'm gonna show a fish hook arrow moving from the carbon hydrogen bond into the carbon atom. Now, what's unique about this is that bond doesn't spontaneously undergo homolysis. It needs to react with something that is a high energy radical to force, to force the homolysis of that carbon hydrogen bond. We're gonna let the bromine atom force that and it's going to steal that one electron. Now what I'm going to show, so I'm gonna show a fish hook arrow going off into the space between the hydrogen and the bromine. Then I'm gonna show the radical on the bromine sort of meeting it in the middle. And this is going to describe the formation of a new covalent bond. And in this case, that's going to be an HBr bond. So the hydrogen was not, did not fall off, rather it was ripped off by the bromine free radical, which gives rise to a carbon free radical. Now, at this point, the carbon free radical abstracts an atom from another molecule. The carbon free radical is going to do the same set of arrows that we just saw. That is, we're going to have three fish hook arrows. One that shows, um, one that shows a bond, excuse me, two that show homolysis, and then two that show um, the formation of a bond. So the one in the middle sort of is the one that kind of goes from being bonded to one thing to being bonded to another thing. Okay, let me just write it. That is to say that we're going to have another bromine bromine. Now, where did this come from? Well, we started with a ton of Br2. When we shined a light on, some of the Br2 split in half. Some of it, not all of it, not all of it absorbed the energy and was able to kind of split in half and maybe some of it actually recombined. We'll get to that in a second. But it's some that hasn't split in half that that carbon centered radical is going to engage. So what happens is, is that the free radical on the carbon atom rips off a bromine atom. Now we show that by taking one electron from the BRBR sigma bond, one electron and moving it into the space between the carbon and the bromine. So these two arrows are going to sort of slap hands that's what I like to think about. Two fish hook arrows come together, slap hands, and we have a new covalent bond. So new bond. And this is going to be a CBr bond. What's going to happen is, is that the, there's another bromine atom that's sort of left out. That other bromine atom is just going to take one of the electrons that you know is no longer bound to the other bromine one of the electrons that's no longer part of a covalent bond, it's gonna hop over to that bromine atom that wasn't able to participate in a bond with carbon to give rise to a 
this structure and another bromine radical. So I have two steps here. I, there's a lot to say. There's a lot to say. Maybe I'll just, just reinforce the arrows here. In the propagation steps, we use three arrows to show how the electrons are going to move. We're going to move one electron in each case. That is, each arrow describes the movement of one electron. Two of those fish hook arrows are going to combine to show the formation of a bond. And one of them is going to show, is going to help with the cleavage. So one arrow is kind of involved with both, right? The arrow in the middle in both cases, um, it's an H in the top case, the central sort of, or the left-hand BR atom in the bottom case. Those are going to be used to break and make bonds. So we only have three arrows total. One of them does two jobs, breaks and makes the bond. Another arrow is going to be doing the attacking or abstracting of an atom. In the top case, it's a hydrogen abstraction. In the bottom case, it's a bromine abstraction. Okay, and then the last arrow is just going to kind of be the odd electron out, literally, that just sort of walks away. Now, what I want to notice about the last step is, first of all, let's pat ourselves on the back. We, whoop, it's not propagation, that's product. <laughs> we made product. Hooray. Okay, we should feel good about ourselves. Not only did we make product, but we, regener we, we regenerated bromine radical. Okay, so this bromine radical now can keep going. I don't really know how to draw that arrow. That's not an electron arrow. That's just me saying the bromine keeps going. It will then, the bromine will come up here. It will react with another molecule of methane, which will form another carbon-centered radical which will react with another Br2, which will form some more product along with another Br dot. So the Br dot makes carbon-centered radical, makes product, makes Br dot, makes carbon-centered radical, makes product, makes Br dot, blah, 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 blah. We keep going. We keep circulating between these two steps until the limiting reagent is consumed. The above two steps keep going until limiting reagent is consumed. Well, this is great. This is great. We're gonna keep doing this until usually our methane is consumed and we have only um, the brominated methane product. So we keep going and going and going. This is great. All we set everything up, we mix everything together. We turn on the light bulb for a little bit, give it a flash of light and walk away and the reaction keeps going and churning over until all of the limiting reagent is consumed. Nothing could go wrong. We form product, we generate more product, we generate more product, we generate more product. Nothing could go wrong unless a gnarly termination step enters into the mix, okay? That is to say, unless termination occurs. Now, before I turn the page, let me just emphasize this. Termination is generally undesired. I'm gonna show termination steps, okay? And when I do, I don't want you to think this is how the cascade gives product, because that's not true. The aforementioned steps are the way that product is formed, right? We form product in that second step that I've drawn. Now, let me just emphasize something for a second. What are these two steps that I've just drawn? Well, I said enter propagation, so let's assume at least one of them is propagation. Actually, both of them are propagation, right? Both are propagation because we have free radicals on the left and we have free radicals on the right. On the top propagation step, we have a bromide radical on the left and a carbon radical on the right. Then we have a carbon radical on the left and a bromine radical on the right, okay? So we have one radical on either side. These are our propagation steps. These are not initiation steps. That's already done. That's in the previous page, okay? So these two steps are gonna keep going once the process is initiated, unless some termination event occurs or unless we run out of the limiting reagent. So what I'm gonna show here are possible termination steps. And let's just address the elephant in the room. 
what if a carbon centered radical that was generated during one propagation step engages with a bromine radical that was either generated during initiation or the second propagation step. If those two come into close proximity and have just the right angle, they can combine. And this looks like our two fish hook arrows slapping high five to form a bond, just like we saw on the previous page. We could allow those two things to engage each other to form something that has no radicals. So we have radicals to no radicals. And that's a termination step. Now, often this is taught the way, and this really bothers me, <laughs> often when we teach free radical chain reaction events, we say, this is great. We formed product. Look, we have bromine attached to a CH3. That was the desired product we wanted to account for. We've done it. Well, the likelihood of this termination event occurring is actually quite low. So number one, this probably isn't happening that often. Maybe sometimes. Avogadro's number is certainly big. If there's a probability at at least of 1%, that means you're going to get a ton of molecules formed this way, right? If you've got 6 times 10 to the 23rd. But, but, I mean, more than a ton, sorry. But this is not the major way that we form product, nor is this the major way we want to form product. This is not just me like being a pedant here. We don't want to form products this way because we have no bromine radical to continue on with propagation. If we combine the bromine radical and the carbon radical, the only other way we're going to get bromine radical back is if we have more initiation events. Okay? We want to form product during propagation because that is what the chain reaction does. Once it starts, it's going to keep going. It doesn't need to continue to be kick started, right? It's just one of those, like, I don't know, you, you kick it and it just keeps going without your intervention, without you inputting energy. Okay. And this is what we want to happen. We want the propagation events to take over. In termination, what I have on the page, that's not what we want to happen because that implies the chain reaction is dead. Yes, the chain reaction sacrificed itself at the formation of one product. That's not enough. We're trying to consume all of the limiting reagent to get an, um, an efficient process. Plus, that's not the only termination step we could see. We could have BR radical combining with BR radical. Well, Maybe somebody could argue that when those two radicals combine and we have fish hook arrows slapping hands to form another covalent bond, when we do this, we get a starting material that we could just reinitiate. Again, that's not what I want to do. I want to initiate it once and then I want it to keep going until all the product is formed. That's what I want. Okay, so this is undesired. Now, what could happen is we could consume all of the limiting reagent, all of the CH4 gets consumed. Then the bromine radicals are sitting around. They're like, I don't have anything else to do. Do you want to hang out? And then they, boom, they pop on together. So this could be a result. This isn't so bad because maybe this is, a re this is what happens at the end of the chain reaction when all of the limiting reagent is consumed and the bromine radicals are floating around looking for something to do. Maybe not the worst. Another termination event that would be so lame is if we had a CH3 radical and a CH3 radical combine. Oh, makes me sick. Why does it make me sick? Well, it's, it's actually pretty cool that we form a carbon-carbon bond. Now, this isn't an efficient process. The probability of two radicals combining in this state when there's so many other opportunities for the radicals is actually quite low. So we're not going to see too much of this combination event occurring, but we still could have the radicals combine. And when they do, they form another alkane and that other alkane could react with more BR dot to get an even more complex mixture of products. So this leads to more halogenation products. So again, with these termination reactions, what I wanna emphasize is in the most way, or for the most part, these are undesired, okay? So they're not desired. And additionally, the probability of many of them occurring is actually quite low. 
So I just don't want this to be something that you commit to memory as what's happening. So instead, what I want you to do is if I gave you the question and I said, let's say we take propane and we react it with F2 in the presence of light and we formed these two products. I'm gonna call this one A and this one B. We've kind of gone over these before. What I would ask you is propose a mechanism, and I'll go on to the next page to do this, for the formation of A and B. Okay. So I'm gonna skip on to the next page, just giving you a second to catch up, and then we're gonna go through this. So this would be the task. Notice, probably don't need a termination step here. Termination will happen if we run out of limiting reagent. But the other thing to think about is termination interrupts um, a chain reaction process and could ultimately kill it prematurely before all of the limiting reagent is consumed, leaving quite a mess to clean up. Okay, so we have these two products, A and B. We want to form, um, we want to show how we form this one. So this was A. So the first thing that happens is that F reacts with, kind of gets energized, excuse me, by the light. And this is an initiation step. During initiation, we see homolysis of the two, excuse me, of the one sigma bond separating the, or connecting the two fluorine atoms, which then become separated to form free radicals. We go from zero radicals to two radicals. In the next two steps, we're going to see propagation occur, where I'm gonna show, I'm gonna label this as HA to remind myself that there are actually two products resulting from two, um, unique opportunities for hydrogen to be abstracted. Whereas in the first case, it's HA that interacts with an F dot. Now, the way this occurs is that the F dot reaches in the middle and the HA comes in and attacks. It forgets about its carbon side sidekick that receives the other electron that was once part of the covalent bond between carbon and hydrogen. And as a result, we form a new carbon centered radical plus HF. So a byproduct HF has been accounted for, but we haven't yet formed the product. Now in this case, we're going to take a carbon centered, the carbon centered radical shown here and react it with another molecule of F2. And when we do that, we are going to abstract a fluorine atom from F2 to release another fluorine radical along with the desired product. So the chain reaction continues because we've generated our product as a result of a propagation step, not as a result of a low probability, ultimately unproductive termination step. So that's product A. Now what about product B? Well, in the case of product B, we're going to use the same initiation step where F2 being an unstable molecule will undergo homolysis to split this fluorine atom in half to give rise to two fluorine radicals. One of which is going to interact with our starting material and it's going to interact at a different position than we saw previously. You might say, well, how do I know where it interacts? Well, sometimes the fluorine atom is going to grab HB and other times it's going to grab HA. A subject of a future lecture will try to um, address when it grabs HA versus HB. The fish hook arrows get a little bit sideways here and we have to kind of curl them and swoop them a little bit, but we wanna show the homolysis of the carbon hydrogen bond as we form a hydrogen fluoride bond. I didn't even recognize here that we're making HF. So HF hydrofluoric acid is actually a weak acid, but is very nasty. It can melt and decompose tissue and that sort of thing. And also because it's weak, it will continue to react over and over again, whereas like HCl actually just burns and then it's done. Anyway, we generate a carbon-centered radical. What I want to notice is that the carbon-centered radical for product B is different than the carbon-centered radical for product A. 
So for product B, we have this carbon centered radical. The final step looks very similar. We just are attaching the fluorine to a different position, but we still see homolysis or fragmentation of the fluorine fluorine bond so that one electron goes one way, one electron goes another way. By slapping hands, as two fish hook arrows combine, we form a new covalent bond and we generate another F dot. And then I'm done. I've generated both of my products, which I'll highlight in orange or whatever. I have product A and product B as a result of abstracting hydrogens A and B from the same fluorine precursor. You might say, do I have to show an initiation reaction in both cases? No, you could just show one initiation reaction and that would be certainly sufficient to propose a mechanism. Do I have to show propagation steps? Yes, the product was formed during propagation steps. So we wanna show two propagation steps for each product that was being formed. Do I have to show a termination step? I would, do, I would prefer it if you didn't. I would prefer that you know what termination steps are, the consequences of termination steps. But when it comes to proposing and, and really describing how a product was formed, let's stick to propagation, which is what we're ultimately trying to design and engineer our chemical reactions that are chain reactions um, from being able to know. So, so what you need to know is you need to be able to look at some starting material and do this propose a mechanism for a free radical halogenation reaction. I also want you to be able to label each of the steps as initiation, propagation, and termination. So we want to be able to do this. And label initiation, propagation, and termination. And I realize that termination should not be included, but sometimes people just insist and um, I have to write some stuff on their exams, but if they at least identify that it was termination, they get some points for it. Okay, but again, we don't, we don't form products by termination because it kills our chain reaction and it's a low probability event. So it's one of those situations where we don't wanna do it and it doesn't really happen that often. When it does, it's annoying and it's bad. <laughs> And when we're working on like tests and that sort of thing and trying to understand these concepts, um, we're not working with ideality all the time. I get it, but I mean, it's on paper. We're speaking theoretically what's happening for the most part when we're generating these products. Okay, so that'll do it for the mechanism lecture. We'll continue to discuss some various aspects of free radical halogenation reactions of alkanes in um, upcoming lectures.